The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. DJ Baller, you killed this. Hello, welcome back, college football faithful. It is week two. It is game day. Tyler and I are bringing you a game day episode for this weekend slate for week two. Uh, Tyler, we made it through the first week. Tyler and I are both wearing black on this lovely day. Uh, you know, it's one of those where nobody expected the team. Well, they wore white last week, but the team in black because they'll be wearing black today. It is the Buffalo of Colorado, and uh, Colorado Buffalo shocked us. So we're wearing black for the Colorado Buffalo. Um, no, we just for Kansas. Just, yeah, yeah. No, we both just happen to be wearing black today. So uh, <laughs> here it is. So um, moving into our lightest part of our segment uh, in a little bit of week one. It was a hectic week one. Saw some upsets. Saw some good wins by some good quality teams to stake their claim as good teams and see where they move forward within the college football rankings. Now, getting to our games of the week. You guys know we start with the ACC as always. Game of the week right here was a fantastic one. Uh, Clemson, the Tigers, ranked in the top 10 at number 9, come into Duke to try and stake their claim as the best team in the ACC and show that they can remain on top. Well, the only problem was Riley Leonard and the Duke Blue Devils stood in their way. Duke defense stepped up and stopped Clemson multiple times in their own field position uh, and converted some turnovers, a lot of turnovers in this game. Uh, Duke wins this game with the offense balancing with the running game 28 to 7 and it, it was one of those performances Tyler where it's it wasn't a Riley Leonard shootout but it was so balanced by Duke that it felt almost like an NFL type offense and just the way they controlled the ball uh that day was just unbelievable but I want to get your thoughts first on how Clemson's offense looked. I mean, Klebniak threw the ball 45 times in this game. And it just that's that seems too much to me. I want to get your perspective on the Clemson offense. Uh, and of course, if Clemson can bounce back from this. Yeah, definitely a lot of concerns with Clemson's offense going forward. I mean, if you just look at their schedule in a couple of weeks, Florida State's uh, coming to their place. And the way that Florida State looked uh, against LSU this past weekend, uh, that game, is definitely going to be uh, teetering on the brink of a blowout if Clemson uh, cannot get it together. Uh, but, yeah, you know, Kid Klubniak, every Clemson fan uh, was really high on this guy. You know, last season we saw him in a couple of games, you know, after DJU. You know, Clemson fans were kicking DJU to the curb, uh, but DJU had a phenomenal game for Oregon State. I think that Oregon State's going to be one of those teams uh, in the Pac-12. But moving back to Clemson's offense, it feels like the only weapon, I know that you're going to agree with me, is the running back, Will Shipley. There was really no wide receivers that got involved in this one. I know that we're all going to talk about Duke. Now, you know, Duke, this was a really good win for them, but just too many turnovers. I feel like every time that they, you know, Clemson got close to scoring, you know, they scored only once, as you see on the scoreboard there. But there's been, you know, there was times when they got into the goal line, and most of the times uh, they fumbled their ball away. So just too many miscues, too, too many turnovers, can't do it. 
against a Duke team. And I like you mentioned, I do agree with you. It wasn't really like the Ryle Leonard game, like over 300 yards passing. He barely got over 200 yards passing. I think that the running game of Duke uh, really got it going, uh, which I was very shocked of. I was very high on this Clemson defense. I thought it was going to be one of the best uh, in the ACC and also the nation. They brought a lot of the experience back. You know, going to their back to their offense, I know I'm going back and forth on this one, but this Clemson team uh, really just confused me of this performance. Uh, you know, they brought in Garrett Riley. We saw what he did with the TCU offense. I know that, you know, they had Max Duggan. They had Ken Kendra Miller. They had Quentin Johnson. There's probably more weapons on that offense. Uh, but, you know, going into this season, you, you know, we had some question marks, of course, with Kate Klevniak. But bringing in a guy like Garrett Riley, you know, we know – Lincoln Riley is his brother, so that has that chemistry in the family of being that high scoring powered offensive guru. It just did not work out. You got to give credit to Duke's defense. Uh, Jacob and I were really on this going back to last season. We were on this whenever we were watching the national championship game. Uh, we said that Duke was going to be one of our teams to watch. And, you know, with Florida State being the runaway right now and, and Clemson uh, already getting this one loss and Duke already being 1-0 in the ACC, now I get it. Hold the brakes. Duke still has to play, you know, the Florida States, North Carolina, the Miamis of the world. But this is a huge program win. Uh, this is like the first AP Top 10 win in a long time. Tip my cap to Mike Elko. I think that he deserves all his praise. I mean, for his second year over there in Durham, I know that everyone wants to say that Duke is a basketball school, but – Surely enough, this team uh, in school is starting to figure out on the football side of it. Absolutely. You know, one thing I'll say about Duke, you know, and back up your point, why we were so high on Duke at the end of last season was, you know, their performance not only late in the season, but in the military bowl against UCF. I think that was really the tipping point for me where it was like, man, Duke's for real. And they need to be looked at as, a really competitive team for next season in the ACC, knowing what we saw with Clemson when they played Tennessee in the Orange Bowl. I mean, the lack of offense in that game on Clemson's part, you know, and this is what we were worried about was this game. Was was Clemson going to be able to score the ball with, with Kay Klubniak in the backfield? And the answer is no. I mean, I mean pretty clearly, you know, where they were going to lean on Will Shipley uh, a lot in this game, and they did. But the problem is, is it's one guy versus 11 other guys. It's just not it, the math doesn't add up. And it's just one of those that nine times out of 10 Duke's defense and their front seven stepped up and stopped the run. And they they brought a lot of pressure all night. So I definitely give a lot of credit to, to the Duke Blue Devils uh, and hope they have a really good season uh, upon them here in the near future. Moving on from this game, we're going to head to our next one. Of course, it's over in the Big 12. This game was a crazy game. Uh, first of all, it started two hours late, um, which was great, considering uh, there was a lot of rain in Wyoming. Yes, folks, it rains in Wyoming. Um, it's not just rolling tumbleweeds. There is stuff in Wyoming. Uh, but this game here, Texas Tech goes on the road to face off against the Wyoming Cowboys. I, I, this is a game, Tyler, I, I just – I was worried about to begin with because uh, I just didn't know what Wyoming was going to be. I don't think anybody really knows exactly what Wyoming's going to be unless you're a Wyoming football fan, and, that, and that's just how it is. I mean, I think people that are Wyoming football fans would say the same thing. Um, my my issue was was – Texas Tech's defense. I mean, last year we talked about Texas Tech's defense stepping up and making big plays. And in this one, I mean, it, it's like their defense took the night off. It was just not not there at all. Uh, run defense was awful. I mean, they let them run all over them from quarterback to running back, you name it. Um, so Wyoming wins this game in double overtime. In Wyoming, 35-33 to 33 over Texas Tech. This is an incredible win for Wyoming. Uh, it's a great start to the season for them. And, of course, the question on our minds here is, is Texas, is Texas Tech still a really good team in the Big 12? Are they going to be able to bounce back from a road loss in a late-night shootout and uh, come out and play a really good Oregon team today? 
Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, it doesn't get any easier for this Texas Tech team. They got Oregon, who put up 81 points against Portland State uh, last week. And so Bo Nix and that offense is going to come in to Texas Tech. Uh, but, yeah, that's definitely going to be an interesting game. We're going to pick that game uh, later on the show. I'm definitely excited to watch that uh, later on today. It should be a fun environment in Lubbock, even with the loss. But, yeah, I was surprised seeing this score, too. I mean, Texas Tech was up 17 to nothing. Yes, 17 to nothing in the first half. They absolutely blew that one. That was one of my worries for Texas Tech. You know, I knew that Texas Tech offense was going to be good, you know, scoring 33 points against a real solid Wyoming defense. You know, like we mentioned, not really not really anybody knows about this Wyoming team. I think that, you know, they're one of those teams that is question marks. We know what Boise State is. We know what Fresno State is. Congratulations to Fresno State getting that four-point victory on the road against uh, Purdue. But, yeah, you know, I'm still on the Texas Tech hype train. They were one of my dark horse teams. Uh, it would just really sucks uh, to see them lose. So, you know, going to Laramie, that's a tough place to play, uh, especially, you know, going uh, from Texas to Wyoming. That's definitely a long road trip. Uh, we, you know, we talk about it all the time, you know, the East Coast team going all the way to the West Coast. This is pretty much the same story. Uh, so I think that Texas Tech, like I mentioned, you know, going up against Oregon, you know, if it was somebody else, they just need a get-right game. I thought that this was going to be their get-right game. Uh, but starting the season 0-2 is definitely not what Texas Tech uh, wants to do, especially in the Big 12. That feels wide open. And, you know, we'll see what, if Texas is for real this uh, weekend against Alabama. And then Oklahoma, the way that their offense is looking, I mean, they're going to be tough to stop, you know, putting up 73 against Arkansas State. So, te- so Texas Tech better figure it out quickly. It would definitely serve them well uh, to get this upset today against number 13, Oregon, just to, just to get themselves back on track before conference play starts up. Yeah, I, I just think that, you know, it's one of those where Texas Tech really needs to bounce back. It, it's just a – and like you said, you know, it could be the travel. And I think the biggest thing probably that affected them is they expect to start two hours before. Preparation gets messed up. It just turned into one of those slot messes where it was just like, you never know what was going to happen uh, in that case. And here's it's a big win for Wyoming. So all credit goes to them and a great win for them at home in front of their home crowd. Uh, moving from the pa- sorry the Big 12, we're going to the Big 10. Um, this game here was a shootout as well. Um, Nebraska goes on the road to face off against the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Uh, Minnesota holds on 13 to 10 in this one and wins at home. Uh, A lot of home teams won in in week one. So uh, home field advantage early in the season already has, has uh, made its claim here. And for this one here, first of all, Minnesota has the best field goal thing of all time. It's anytime the opponent is kicking a field goal, this giant gopher, comes up on the, like, it's just, it's like the greatest thing of all time. This gopher is giant and, and it's just on the screen right behind where they're kicking and whichever end zone they're in. And it's probably, it's probably doesn't distract the kicker very much. Cause I don't, I don't know if the kicker is actually looking at the goalpost. That'd be a question for a kicker. Uh, if they're actually looking at the goalpost or the ball, I would think the ball. Uh, so I don't know who they're distracting, but it's just a good time, and I think it's hilarious. And they take full opportunity of, of using the Golden Gopher uh, to distract the other team. Uh, but this one here, you know, I was very I – don't, I don't know what the word is. I was very interested to see how Matt Rule was going to change this Nebraska offense. And, and as far as I'm concerned, 10 points on the road really – they haven't changed much to anything. And uh, it, it just seems like Nebraska is going to be in limbo all season here and, and float around. It just, these two teams just don't look ready right now. Uh, and it just could be the sign of week one woes or, you know, but it was just the battle of who could get out of the single digits, really, for the most part. So, um, yeah, turnover battle is big in this one as well. Uh, but I want to get your thoughts on this, and I don't know if – how does Nebraska find their way back, uh, you know, after a game like this on the road? It is a tough environment in Minnesota, but how do they how do they get back on track, you know, after this? And then they got to go on the road to face off against the hot Colorado team. 
Yeah, that's not, definitely not going to be easy. Yeah, definitely a disappointing loss for them. I feel like Nebraska just keeps finding ways uh, to lose these close games. You know, we saw it in the Scott Frost era, uh, and that's how he got fired because Nebraska, you know, many, many times they you know, were in games where they lost by three points or, or less or seven points or less. Uh, it was just the same story. Once again, I do still uh, believe in Matt Rule. I think that Matt Rule is uh, definitely a fantastic coach. Uh, he's one at places where it's definitely hard, you know, in Baylor, I know in his first year wasn't that great. And then his second year, Baylor goes on uh, to uh, compete for a Big 12 championship. And then at Temple, you know, at Temple, we haven't even, you know, heard about him ever since uh, Matt Rule has left that uh, place. Uh, you know, Temple, same thing. His first year wasn't good, but his second year, they win the American championship. Uh, so, you know, maybe the first year work out the Kings and second year, I think that in Nebraska, it's going to be just fine, but the quarterback play is just so inconsistent. Uh, three turnovers, uh, three interceptions of that game by Sims is not going to cut it. You know, Nebraska led this game uh, for the majority of They had it, had the lead uh, late in the fourth quarter. And then Minnesota wide receiver just made the catch of the year uh, right now, you know, tiptoeing his way in the back corner of the end zone. So you got to give credit to Minnesota that, you know, this was just a typical Big Ten game you know both offenses are just feeling each other out and the defenses are there I don't think that Nebraska's defense uh, is to worry you know Minnesota's offense isn't the best in the Big Ten Nebraska as they go on you know this you know today they're going to be tested by a Colorado offense is just tore up TCU's defense put up 45 points and, and over 500 yards of offense so I think that we're really going to find out if Nebraska is on the right path today against Colorado because Colorado right now it's now a top 25 team, and Nebraska going up against the top 25 team, especially on the road. I want to see if this offense can compete against Colorado's offense. So I think that Nebraska, you know, this is a game one loss. Uh, def if you're a Nebraska fan, definitely no panic. But you got to feel for these Nebraska fans. I feel like every year they're in these close games, but yet they find some way that, you know, no other team, you know, if you're another, another team, you usually win these games. But Nebraska – if you're in a close game, like they just cannot win these close games. So hopefully they can figure that out and it's got to go out quick because I think that the Big Ten West, you know, we saw Illinois uh, last night against Kansas didn't look very good. Wisconsin, we'll see how they look today against uh, Washington State. So I think in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll find out who's really going to come out of this Big Ten West on top and also Iowa today against Iowa State. Yeah, no, you make a really good point. You know, it's one of those that, you know, Nebraska, you know, has 92,000 people show up for a volleyball game, but uh, yeah. they're, they're not going to get 92 people, 92,000 people to show up for a Nebraska football game. I'm sorry. You're not going to sell it out, but you'll sell out the volleyball game in the stadium. I, that was pretty cool. I give it to them. That was. So uh, a, a lot of credit goes to that, but you know, we'll see how Nebraska football bounces back. I, I'll be very interested to see. And of course, today's game will be, you know, the first test that we'll get to see them play a really good football team and a team that's, brand new to, to college football uh, that nobody, I don't think, has ever seen before. Uh, and it'll be a really fantastic one to tune into. Moving away from this one to our Pac-12 game out west here. Uh, good, good game. Speaking of Colorado, this was the game of week one, in my opinion. Colorado goes on the road to Fort Worth, Texas, and takes down 17th-ranked TCU 45-42. to uh, you know, uh, this game, it's its hard to, I mean, this is like Big 12 football at its finest, uh, really, for the most part. It's its Colorado coming in. Nobody knows what they're going to be like. TCU's ranked 17 in the country. I think TCU was ranked too high to begin with. I think it was, they got to put them somewhere up there in the middle of the pack because they made it to the national championship last year. They have to do something in order to, you know, keep them in there. Uh, Cause I mean, you lost your quarterback, you lost your best receiver, you lost your starting running back. I mean, you lost a lot of skill players uh, from what I've seen, what, from what I've seen in this game, TCU doesn't have any lack of offense offensively. Sonny Dykes has that team ready to play in the big 12. My problem is, is TCU's defense was absolutely atrocious. You cannot give up over 500 yards to a quarterback that this is his first Division One start. 
you cannot give up 500 yards of passing. That is terrible. Uh, as far as rush defense goes, they gave up four touchdowns to the running back. Four. Uh, I can't remember the last time I saw a running back in college football score four touchdowns. Um, and on the other side of the football, Travis Hunter basically got anything he wanted from Colorado and made TCU look silly. It was kind of one of those where TCU turns the ball over three times in the red zone and they shot themselves in the foot. I mean, they easily could have won this game had they controlled the football, take your medicine and get out. Um, especially against the Colorado team. You just don't know what to expect. I mean, Dion's going to have something up his sleeve. Uh, and it's just one of those that it, it was just bound to happen uh, coming down to this game. And, you know, the last team to get the football generally wins games like this. And Colorado took full advantage. I mean, they go down the field. Shadur Sanders basically puts the team on his back and goes all the way down the field and they score a touchdown and win this. Uh, um. I'm shocked by how that game turned out, but at the same time, I'm not, you know, the betting odds were 20 and a half points to TCU at home. If you took the 20 and a half points, you are an idiot. You are an idiot. If you took 20 and a half points for TCU to cover, you are insane. There is no way. I, the, the problem is, is this isn't Jackson state. It's not a Jackson state football team. Sure. They got a lot of kids from Jackson state. It's a different level of football. I get it. But at the end of the day, it's an, it's a team going out there to play football. And it, did TCU maybe look over Colorado and say, look, we're the 20-and-a-half-point favorite at home? They might have. I mean, who knows? But for TCU to give up 45 to an opposing team, this is our first time at Division One with this many guys that hasn't played Division One at all, and you give up 45 and lose at home, it's a bad sign for TCU, I think, in the Big 12, and it's going to be tough for them, I think, to bounce back. Now, Tyler, the question is, is Colorado for real this season? Um, I want to get your opinion. I think they are for real. I honestly think Colorado is for real because as far as the running game goes, strong running backs. Uh, Travis Hunter looks like he's going to take well over 100 snaps per game this season. An interesting stat before I get you to answer this question. Travis Hunter entering last the first game of the season was in 80 to 1 odds to win the Heisman Trophy. He has now gone from 80 to 1 all the way up to 16 to 1 odds in the fifth best chance to win the Heisman Trophy this year. So just let that sink in while you answer this question. Yeah, that's definitely insane, and I think that Travis Hunter is a dog. I saw that same thing. You know, we saw Shadir Sanders and Travis Hunter skyrocket their names up the Heisman board. Uh, but, yeah, I definitely think that Colorado can definitely contend uh, in the Pac-12. Now, don't get me wrong, the Pac-12 is absolutely loaded in quarterback talent, but I think that Shadir Sanders has made a name for himself, and if he could do it today against a really solid Nebraska defense, and I think that Colorado, you know, Vegas only put their win total heading into this year at three and a half. I think that they're going to eclipse that. You know, they get USC at home in a couple of weeks. Just imagine, like, the hype is just going to explode if Colorado pulls off that upset in Boulder against USC. Like, everybody would just lose their minds. Everybody loves Dion already. Just imagine if he knocks off a college football playoff slash national title contender. But I definitely think that this Colorado offense is ready to compete. In the Pac-12, their defense is not. I just don't think that their defense is there. I definitely think that Travis Hunter, don't get me wrong, he's going to be one of the best cornerbacks in that conference. Uh, but they're just missing guys on other levels uh, in the secondary and also in the defensive line. You know, they didn't really get a lot of pressure uh, on Chandler Morris. So now TCU side, I mean, there's definitely a lot of concern there. Don't get me wrong. You know, I think that their offense, like you mentioned, is going to be fine. Their defense, though, I think that they're going to get exposed uh, by, you know, Texas of the world. Jalen Daniels is probably going to expose that defense, uh, too. Uh, but didn't we really just see this coming? I mean, this is a team that lost so much talent to the NFL. You know, no more Max Duggan, no more Keandre Miller, no more Quinn Johnson. All those guys are gone. Pretty much the whole entire offensive production is gone, and they still put up 42 points. Now, I get it. Colorado's defense is going to be one of the best ones, uh, but 
I think that this TCU offense is going to be just fine. You know, Wiley, they're tied in. He's going to be one of the top targets on that roster. But I got to talk about Colorado's running back. I mean, that Edwards kid is blazing fast. I mean, four touchdowns. I mean, come on. This man is an absolute stud. Everyone wants to talk about Sanders. Everyone wants to talk about Hunter. But give my man Edwards credit. And Dion, what a heck of a win. I think that Colorado is going to keep that momentum going into uh, today's game against Nebraska. It'll be a great one to watch. I am looking forward to it. Uh, and we'll see if Colorado uh, is that team this year in the Pac-12 and chase down USC because they really could be the second best team in the Pac-12 this season. And if they knock off USC, here we are uh, talking about a very good quality Colorado team that could be in a New Year's Six Bowl. So uh, very interesting to see. The, the big changes there and more to come, I'm sure, as the season rolls on. On to our last recap of week one. It is to the SEC. Uh, number five, LSU, goes to this neutral site game. Well, let's call it neutral site uh, in Orlando. And it was kind of Florida State's home game now, kind of like LSU had last year in New Orleans. They had their home game. Uh, so this one was a camping world. And, 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 you know, Florida State comes in as number eight. Uh, Florida State wins this game big, forty-five to twenty-four over LSU. Um, I, I will say, LSU's offense pretty much picked up where they left off last year. I didn't see much change as far as LSU's offense goes. Defensively, and this is Tyler. I said it. I said it last week on the show. I said, please pay attention to LSU secondary. If LSU secondary does not wake up, they will get destroyed. And as far as I as I watched that game, their secondary got lit up the entire game. 45 points uh, to Florida State. I can't remember the last time LSU has given up 45 points. It's been a while. Um, it just defensively, they are not there at all. And, and they need to wake up and pretty quickly because it doesn't get any easier other than today's game against Grambling. But, you know, after that, good luck. I mean, they they have to figure it out um, and fast. You know, Brian Kelly did say that you, they were not prepared, and that is clear. They were not prepared. It, it is definitely a lack of preparation and maybe just experience at the secondary level. Um, but – as far as Florida State goes, I was very impressed with Jordan Travis. Uh, one mistake, really. Um, but aside from that, they were able to score the football at will. They moved the ball so quickly, and uh, it it is kind of it is cool to watch them move the football as quickly as they do um, down the field. They definitely play north south football, and it, it's an exciting team to watch. They will be probably one of the top scoring teams in the nation, I think, this year. I don't think 45 is going to be as much as they score throughout the season. Um, you know, if it does come down to a shootout with them in Clemson, they'll win it. I, I just don't I don't have belief in Clemson to go out and put up this many points in a game because I don't think they will all season. Um, so I, I do think that Florida, Florida State, excuse me, it, it could be a really good contender for a national championship. Of course, last week when I gave my top four, I did have Florida state in there. Uh, and definitely, I, I think that they can be a really good juggernaut team and definitely be a strong ACC team for years to come. Uh, and for LSU, it's back to the drawing board. Uh, get your guys healthy and get ready for week three. He got week two, you know, today against Grambling and it's just a, Got it out, get rid of it, and start with a fresh, clean slate with a win and go into week three re-energized. Uh, but I want to get your thoughts, you know, on LSU's defense, of course. Uh, and then, you know, what's the limit for Florida State? Uh, yeah, I'll, first I'll go on to LSU's defense, uh, what happened. You know, I think that the secondary, I, I said it, you know, multiple times uh, throughout our multiple shows uh, that we have done that. The LSU secondary, you know, Last year, uh, you know, Brian Kelly was pretty much doing the same thing, going to the transfer portal. We saw Jer guys like Jared Bernard Converse. Uh, you know, we, we picked up a guy 
uh, Makai Gardner uh, from Louisiana Lafayette. And it was pretty much the same year. You know, you saw Deuce Chestnut of uh, the Syracuse transfer, Zion Alexander, who was the southeastern Louisiana guy. But, uh, you know, going from the FCS uh, to facing off against the offense like Florida State uh, is completely different. I feel like, you know, Mason Smith uh, being suspended was definitely a huge blow. And I don't even know what the heck uh, that Brian Kelly was trying to do of Harold Perkins trying to play in like a true linebacker, not trying to play in like a jack linebacker and rush after the quarterback. LSU wasn't able to get uh, zero pressures uh, in that game. They had zero sacks, and that was a problem in last year's game, and that's what ultimately lost them this game. Uh, But, you know, LSU's offense, they got off to a fast start, but they just weren't able to execute whenever they got into the goal-to-go situation. There was multiple times where they had fourth down, uh, inside a, a Florida State's red zone, they weren't able to get that big play to get to build up the lead. And you know, 17 to 14 going into the half, you know, it was a back and forth battle. You know, it was one of the, the game of the weekends. And then you go turn it on in the second half. And then Florida State, sooner or later, they scored 31 points uh, unanswered uh, in the fourth quarter. You know, Keon Coleman, the wide receiver, uh, the Michigan State transfer, he had an absolute game, three touchdowns. Uh, Jordan Travis, you know, he really just showed me why that I had him on my Heisman watch list entering the season. I think that he's going to be an absolute stud. They didn't really have to rely on the running game too much because they were just going after the weakness of these LSU cornerbacks. So I think now on Florida State, I think the sky's the limit. Yes, I think that they can be a national championship contender. I think that not only do they have a championship level offense, but I mean that defense just got after Jane Daniels on Sunday night. Jared Verse, he's an absolute dog. I mean, they were just going after LSU's offensive line. I think that's going to be a mismatch going forward. Who, Whatever offensive line Florida State faces, they're going to have the advantage every single time. I think that Florida State's defense is going to be just fine holding an LSU offense to 24 points. You're probably not going to see an offense like that for the entire season. Just look at Clemson. So I think that Florida State – I mean, they just feel like a lock to me in the college football playoff. Honestly, I just don't see any team on this schedule beating them. They would have to beat themselves. So I am really high after the Knowles. I think that everyone talked about Colorado in week one, but I think that Florida State made the statement of the weekend in week number one. Absolutely. It was a fantastic win by Florida State. Uh, you know, and speaking of that, them possibly being a national championship contender, let's get to our risers and followers. It's our first segment of risers and followers for the season i'm so happy so ap top 25 risers and followers folks if you don't know how it works this is how it works tyler and i both pick a team that we think has rised up the top 25 and that is making a big move uh and our second picks of course are our followers uh is our ones that just fell off the face of planet earth and they shouldn't have, and it, it, it looked really nasty. So uh, generally we like to start with the negative. So we're going to start with the fallers. Tyler, who is your first faller uh, in this AP top 25 segment for the season? Well, I think if you see it on the background, you know who I'm going with. I'm going uh, with my own team. I'm going with LSU. I'm just going to bite the bullet here. Uh, LSU definitely has some work to do. Like you mentioned, I think that they will get the victory. Today against Grambling, the real – well, not really the real season began. The real season began for them in week number one. Uh, so, once you get the one loss in the season over, you know, this was a team uh, that a lot of people were trying to pick the West. You know, winning the SEC West is still up for grads. Uh, but, you know, SEC play starts in week number three uh, for them uh, when they travel to Mississippi State. So, But if you want to get to the college football playoff, you got to win out and win the SEC championship. That's a tall order. Uh, so, I think that if LSU still wants to say this season – get 10 wins, get nine wins. They have to figure it out uh, this week, you know, get that statement victory, get you feeling good about themselves because it's not feeling very good in that locker room and the practice that whole entire week after you got your butts handed to you. Uh, So I think that with LSU with the high expectations being number five, now falling all the way to nine spots to number 14, uh, LSU better figure it out quick or it might get ugly down there in Baton Rouge. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to go with the other Tigers of Death Valley. I'm going to go with the Clemson Tigers. Bad loss. Um, you know, you go on the road to Duke. It's a tall order, but Clemson falls 16 spots from 9 to 25 to round up the top 25. That's a long ways. Uh, but you know what? It, it, if you only score seven points on Duke, it, that that's 
a big reason for you to fall that far. And uh, yeah, you know, we talked about, it. I just think too much leaning on Will Shipley and too much uncertainty from Clay, from Cade Klubniak. Klubniak, I just, I don't think he's, I just don't think he's ready for this type of football. I just don't think he's ready for it. It's just one of those that I think too much too quickly for him there. Of course, getting thrown in there for the Orange Bowl game last season. We saw a little bit of uh, just just not ready. And it definitely has bit Clemson in the rear. Uh, And uh, they could struggle to score points this season. I mean, they could be the Iowa of the ACC um, this season. So I could see them well outside of the top 25 by the end of the season if uh, they can't score the football. So, uh, Tyler, who is your riser for this week? Uh, This is exciting. So we got two risers uh, here that I hope that really could could possibly be in the the college football playoff for the end of the season. Well, I have a feeling who I know that you're going to go with, so I'm going to go ahead uh, and just take the team uh, that I've been high on in the ACC. It's a team that beat your father, and that is the Duke Blue Devils. Uh, You know, Mike Elko, very impressed with this team. That defense just ate up Cade Klubniak. Uh, and that offense, I think that Riley Leonard, uh, you know, didn't do too much, like you mentioned at the earlier the show, but I think that running game uh, really took off. Uh, so I think that Duke getting this first win, their first AP top 10 win in a very long time. And the, like I mentioned, the schedule doesn't get any easier, but definitely a huge win to find themselves in the top 25 is definitely a huge win for this program moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, getting to mine, my riser, it's the Colorado Buffalo no uh, being outside the top 25, I got to go with the Buffalo. Um, you know, it speaks volumes for them to put up as many points as they did, like we said. Uh, now sitting at 22, of course, your Duke Blue Devils there are sitting at 21. Uh, both teams that I think after this upcoming week, if they both get wins and get to 2-0, and uh, I could see them inside the top 20. There's some ranked matchups that we're going to see today uh, that could determine where some of these teams fall. And ultimately, some teams lose in the top twenty-five. Not every, not every team in the top twenty-five is going to win week to week. So that's a nice thing that we can see with the top twenty-five. Um, I, I think that Colorado has a lot of upside, and uh, I just don't think that we've fully seen a team. Uh, and, and we might, I mean, we might see a team expose them to the point where, you know. We could retract our statement, but, you know, right now, Colorado looks to be clicking on all cylinders, um, and that's why they're my riser for this week. Um, So got some good ones. So Duke and Colorado, you guys are our winners for uh, week one of the uh, top 25 risers. And our losers here are the two lovely Tigers of Death Valley that uh, are taking, packing their bags and taking themselves out to Death Valley because... Uh, those are two losses that really hurt both of those teams. Um, but we will see who is on for this next week uh, from today's games and, and this weekend's games. Um, now moving from this one, we'll get into our games of the week, our lovely games of the week. And we start in the ACC with our games of the week. And it is an SEC team taking a little vacay, as we like to call it, down to Miami. And uh, the 23rd ranked Texas A&M, the Aggies. I, I, how are they ranked in the top 25? I don't know. Um, they seem to be down there every season for some strange, odd reason. And it might be because their stadium's cool or whatever. I, I don't know. Or Jimbo gives them a few extra dollars and they put them in the top 25. I have no idea. Uh, but they open as a three-point favorite uh, against Miami. The Hurricanes. I, I, uh, I, I'm curious to see where this game goes offensively for Texas A&M. I'm curious to see how well they can score the football um, against Miami. They didn't seem to have any trouble against New Mexico last week. Of course, it's it's New Mexico, so uh, there's little to be said about that. Uh, as far as Miami goes, I I would like to see number one how they play at home. At home will be very interesting to see. Um, you know, you defend home last week against Miami, Ohio. 
uh, and you win a good one there, 38-3, you know, your defense holds up well. This could be a very low-scoring game. Uh, if Miami's defense steps up and gets stops against a and I think the biggest thing is probably the running game in this one. Uh, for me, I will take Miami to win this game at home. Um, I, I think Miami can do it at home. I just don't know about a and Early in the season, they seem to slip up. And it's just one of those things where they constantly feel like they're crawling back from behind uh, early in the season and they just can't ever get there. So uh, I'm going to take Miami to win this one at home. It's going to be a tough road trip for A&M. And uh, I'll go maybe a little 28-24 win here. Uh, Miami cover that three, go in the other direction. Yeah, this was a very ugly game last year. I mean, just both offenses stunk, stunk it up last year. Uh, and the last week, uh, the ACC dominated the SEC. You know, we saw North Carolina defeat uh, South Carolina and then Florida State uh, take down LSU. So we'll see. If Miami uh, can give ACC the three, uh, the third win, and then we have Vanderbilt and Wake Forest to complete uh, the quote unquote, you know, ACC SEC challenge that's going on uh, on the gridiron here. Uh, but you know, Texas A&M's offense uh, really impressed me in week number one. I know it was against New Mexico, but put, putting up 52 points, I mean, they were not doing that last year of Haynes King and you know Jimbo Fisher calling the plays. Now that they have an offense coordinator calling the plays. Bob Petrino looked very solid. I think that Connor Weigman, they found, finally found a quarterback that can throw the ball downfield, get their deep shots. That's what they were missing with Max Johnson and Haynes King uh, last year. They definitely had the playmakers. You know, I know that eight chain isn't there, but they had the playmakers on the outside in the slot with Moose Muhammad and also Evan Stewart, too, and Anaya Smith. So I definitely think they had the playmakers to score. I think that, like I like you said, I think this is going to be more defensive battle. I think that Miami's defense has to be able to come to play. Tyler Van Dyke last year struggled with injuries. I think that he's just determined this year uh, to get a bounce back. You know, Miami last year was absolutely pathetic. You know, they lost Mill Tennessee. They were under 500. Mario Cristobal's first year did not go so well. I think that at home, I'm hoping that Lee, that you know this Miami crowd and the Hurricanes faithful can come out and support them because the home support is what this team needs. Uh, I think that I'm going to agree with you. I think that Miami, this program is just hungry for a big win. I think that they deserve it. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think that Texas A&M is definitely one of those dark horse teams and teams to watch in the SEC West. Uh, but I just feel like Miami just needs this win very, very badly, especially the way that the ACC is setting up to be a runaway with Florida State. Uh, so I think that this is going to be a close game. I am going to take the Hurricanes at, at home. I'll go uh, 24 to 21. I think it's going to be a field goal game. It's going to be a back and forth battle. Probably whoever has the football is going to win this game, uh, but I'll go with the Canes uh, getting the big dub at, at home. Yeah, I, I, I'm i glad we agree on the underdog here, you know, to open games of the week. It's like such a close one. It's hard to think that AM can cover a three point spread on the road, you know, especially with the woes. And I'm glad we're on the same page as far as this game goes. Uh, but my interesting one would probably be the next one that we're going to go to, and it's the Big 12. Uh, this is going to be a really good game. Uh, I, I am so trying to figure out if Texas is going to be able to score the football on Bama. Or is it going to be a is it going to be a battle of offensive shootout? And I just don't know. Um, my biggest thing here is Texas's defense. Can they step up and get stops on Alabama? Alabama week one, could they score the football much at all? I think they had 14 points of the half against Middle Tennessee State, which is pretty atrocious. Um, but for them, can they score the football early? Are they going to be able to, to get stops against Texas? Texas was able to run the ball on them a lot last year in this game, uh, and that's kind of how they battled the – the quarterback injury situations, uh, you know, with Quinn Ewers, I just think that this is different. No Hudson card there anymore. Of course, the backup is Arch Manning. I, I just, I, I'm kind of in a situation where it's a coin flip. Uh, seven points to Bama at home for this one. I, I'll probably go with Bama in this one. I just don't know if Texas can go into Tuscaloosa and win this. It's too much of a tall task, I think. Uh, I think teams are going to struggle to score the football in this game. I think it'll be a pretty low-scoring game. 
uh, with respects to the Big 12. Uh, I think that it's probably going to be a 21-17 game, but I'll I'm going to lean more towards that uh, probably around 24-17. Alabama, give them the touchdown. I just don't know if Texas is going to be able to score that much in, in in Tuscaloosa. So I've got Bama taking the win to stay in the top in the top four uh, as of right now. Yeah, this was definitely a phenomenal game last year. You know, the narrative of last year's game, if Quinn Ewers doesn't get hurt, Texas probably wins that game. I think that now, Quinn Ewers, you have a healthy Quinn Ewers. uh, I think that we're going to find out if either one of these teams are legit. I think that, you know, Texas, they're receiving a lot of hype. Are they back? You know, the Big 12, this is their final year. You know, can they go out on top? And then Alabama, I feel like it's been like half and half. You know, the ESPN analysts have picked them to win the national championship. You have another half saying that, like, okay, Alabama. Bryce Young's not there. They lost, you know, Jameer Gibbs. They lost Will Anderson. They're not going to be as good. They're probably like a 10-2 season. I think I'm more of Alabama is still there. As long as Nick Saban's coaching, they're going to be very, very good. Uh, so I definitely think this is a different environment. You know, Texas was a home team last year. You know, it was a fuel goal. Came down to a field goal with my real right card uh, in the last uh, couple of seconds. So we'll see if it's as close. You know, it feels like every week we get this big game and then it's just a blowout. You know, we saw it last week, LSU versus Florida State. We'll see if this, you know, I'm honestly, I know that Texas has 11 by them, but this just feels like a top 10 matchup, you know. So I think the matchup for this one, I think that, you know, Jalen Milrow, this is going to be his first test at the starting quarterback. You know, he did really well against Middle Tennessee State, but Middle Tennessee is going to be very good. You know, Jalen Milrow got the start last year whenever Bryce Young was hurt against Arkansas. He was able to use his legs. But I think that, you know, we he, we know that he can use his legs, but I think that we need, we need to figure out if he can throw the ball down the field against a really good Texas defense, you know. Texas didn't really show most of their cars on the offensive side of the ball. You know, they got the 30-point victory against Rice and said, okay, we're good. Let's go on to the game that's going to define our season. Because if Texas wins this game, they could be right in the college football playoff discussion because I think that their schedule really sets up nicely. And then, you know, they get the Oklahoma-Red River rivalry game that's going to come down to it. Uh, But it just feels like, you know, last year's game was close, but not this year's. I think Alabama is going to show them why they're still on the top i'm not really the sec it feels like georgia is still right there right now but it just feels like alabama is not going to go away from here and texas is going to go right back to the drawing board saying like are we actually for real so i think that alabama is going to show them i think that they covered the seven points and i think it won't really be close i'll go 31 to 14 alabama gets the win at home brian denny at night is just a different animal in texas you're not ready for it yeah, you know, you made a really good statement, you know, about Jaden Milrow. I think Milrow, you know, brings a different dynamic to Alabama's offense. And I don't think Texas, you know, it was very different from last year with Bryce Young, you know, different. He's a pocket passer for the most part. Um, Milrow is a scramble guy. He's elusive in the pocket, can get out, make some runs. You know, last game running for seven, seven times, two touchdowns. So, uh, I think it's very different. So home crowd behind Bama, we're both taking uh, the tide in this one. I I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it very well could be a landslide, like you said. I, I just think that it's going to be tough for Alabama to score the football. I just don't know if they fully figured out how to score the football well. Uh, and, of course, passing is my biggest question mark. Like you said, can Milrow throw the ball down the field and, and trust his arm? So we shall see. Um for this one to be a great night game tonight. I, I am ready for that one. That'll be a fantastic game uh, for this SEC Big 12 shootout. It might be a welcome to the SEC for Texas in this one, so we shall see uh, this game probably a lot in the future, so we will see where we end up after tonight. Moving out of this one to our Big 10 game of the week. This one here, all the question marks are for the home team. Nebraska, the Cornhuskers, are headed to Boulder to take on the now-ranked 22 Colorado Buffalo, who open as a three-point favorite at home. I don't think this is enough, Tyler. We will get to this in our next segment, of course. I don't think this is enough. I I am very, very high on the Colorado side of the football. 
I think offensively they're going to be able to score at will. TCU's defense, I think, is better than Nebraska's defense. Hear me, hear me out. And they put up 45 on TCU. So for me to say that their defense is it, it, TCU's defense is better than Nebraska's defense. I don't know how Nebraska's defense is going to fare on the road in Colorado. It'll be sold out for sure. Um, and they'll probably be there at Mm, I don't know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning, you know, type thing. They're probably there now. It's just, it's one of those where everybody is waiting outside for this game and waiting for the floodgates to open up. I am very interested to see number one, how Colorado can run the football. Can Nebraska's run defense step up? Run defense has been good in the past offensively uh, for Nebraska. Are they going to be able to move the football? They clearly couldn't against Minnesota. Minnesota was a good defensive team. Uh, Colorado might take advantage, play a little zone in this one. Um, I think Colorado gets the win. I, I am very determined for this Colorado team to open up 2-0 and and really get into the meat and potatoes of their schedule. Um, this one here, three points. God almighty. I, I think that this is probably a 38-10 to game. Uh, I mean, I think... Colorado could win by 28 here. I think they could win by four touchdowns. So I, I'm going to go with the Buffalo big in this one. Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, coming off of a big win, we always say, is this a letdown spot? I'm just not really seeing it. I just feel like Dion's just a different style of coach. He's going to get his guys ready to play. You know, it, it's his first home game uh, in Boulder. Like you mentioned, it's already sold out. It's been sold out uh, since the start of the season. I, I think that, you know, Nebraska's got offense. I think the biggest question mark is, Nebraska's offense, uh, if they can score against the Colorado defense, that was a little suspect in week one against TCU, but you could say the same thing. How is Nebraska defense going to stop uh, Shadir Sanders and his offense that just absolutely torched uh, TCU's defense? So something's got to give. I think that, you know, Colorado uh, last, you know, last week, they were more of, you know, like we're the hunters. And now they feel like, you know, now that they have a number by their names, they feel like more of the hunt hit. So how's, you know, the mindset going to change? I really don't think the mindset is really going to change in that locker room. Deion Sanders brings all the swagger uh, to that team and to that locker room. I just feel like, you know, Nebraska's offense, if this gets into a shootout, that's advantage Colorado because I just don't think that Nebraska, their quarterback and their offense is just really built to score 30 or even 40 points to keep up with Colorado. So I think based on that, I am going to go with Colorado and lay the three-point spread. I just think that, you know, Vegas either is trying to tell us something or just trying to hand out free money at this rate, uh, taking Colorado at three. So I think it's in Boulder. It's going to be an absolute raucous environment. Big noon kickoff is going to be your favorite. Gus Johnson is going to be calling the game uh, in a couple of hours. So I'm going to go Colorado. I don't think they score, you know, 40 points like they did last uh, time. I think that Nebraska defense definitely has more talent in all three levels than TCU did. But I think that Colorado uh, really wins this one, and it's not remotely close. I just wasn't very impressed with Nebraska. So I'll go 28-10. Uh, to 10. I think that they get the 18-point victory at home. Go in style, uh, especially, you know, in front of the home crowd. They definitely deserve it. Uh, so Colorado will have them moving to 2-0. and Yeah, uh, moving away from this game to the Pac-12, we're going to move pretty quick through this one and the SEC game. Uh, Oregon on the road is the six-point favorite uh, traveling to Lubbock to face off against Texas Texas Tech after their tough loss on the road in Wyoming. Um, I'll say it pretty quick. I think Oregon's going to win this game by quite a bit. Um, I'll give Oregon the win. Um, probably going to be a 31-21 to 31, 21 win, I think. I think they'll cover 10 in this one. Uh I just don't see any team stopping Oregon from scoring the football right now. Bo Nix seems to be dialed in pretty well early in the season, which is a good sign for Oregon football. Uh, will they be able to compete with Colorado and with USC for the Pac-12 championship and Utah for the Pac-12 championship? Uh, we shall see. I think Texas Tech has taken a step back, especially from a week one loss on the road uh, in a game that I'm pretty sure they thought they could go in and win pretty easily. Uh, this one is really tough. I mean, uh, it's it's almost impossible, I think, for me to even consider taking Texas Tech at home in this one, which would be a crazy upset win at home. 
uh, for them to do it, to pull it off. But I would not be surprised if this is very one-sided quickly. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either, but Lubbock is a tough place to play and crazy things uh, have happened. Uh, but like you mentioned, they did take a, a step back. You know, if a week ago I would have taken – like this was going to be my upset pick of the year. I told Jacob, uh, you know, off the air that I was going to pick Texas Tech if they ended up beating Wyoming. They, it just felt like a, a tough road trip uh, for Oregon. But after seeing Oregon, I don't, I don't care if it was Portland State or Blue Mountain State. They put up 81 points against a football team, and I think that this is going to be an offensive slugfest. You know, Texas Tech's defense it just didn't really impress me. Uh, so I think that they do end up covering. You know, this is definitely going to be a tough road test for them, uh, but I think that Oregon gets to 40 points here. I mean, Texas Tech's uh, defense, uh, they definitely have to get prepared uh, for what's about to come. Bo Nix just feels like he's on a mission in his sixth year. It feels like he's been there forever. Uh, so I think that Oregon uh, wins this game. I'll say uh, 41 to 28. I think that Texas Tech is going to – it wouldn't surprise me. This is a close game at the half, uh, but I feel like the Ducks are, are going to pull away uh, late in this one. And last one here in the Power Five to the SEC to round it out. Uh, battle of two teams in the 20s here. Uh, Ole Miss, number 20 Ole Miss, is headed to New Orleans as the seven-point favorite uh, to face off against the Tulane Green Wave. Tulane wins a good game at home against South Alabama to stay in the top 25 and not move. Uh, and, of course, Ole Miss with a crazy, crazy victory um, and, and kind of a one-sided game against Mercer. Mercer seems to be the poor little team that has to face off and get their few million dollars from getting destroyed and move on with their lives uh, against the SEC. Ole Miss hangs up a whopping 70 plus points in this one, uh, which is a school record for them. Congratulations with the school record, but here we go. This is a tough game. Uh, Ole Miss traveling to Tulane. I I'm very concerned uh, with Ole Miss in this one. Tulane's defense looks good and to hold South Alabama to 17 was pretty impressive. Um, South Alabama scored the ball a lot last year, quite a bit. Uh, against power five teams so i'm very concerned about where tulane or i'm sorry about ole miss and how they're going to be able to do it offensively defensively they're a good team uh it could be a low scoring one in this one and i think it will be um I i'm gonna go with a two-lane upset though and i think it's gonna be an upset because seven points to ole miss is quite a few for a ranked matchup um I think Tulane can win this by a touchdown or a field goal. I'll go with a field goal. I'll go 24-21 in this one. Tulane's just too hard of a place to play, I think, for Ole Miss to come in and get an easy victory. Yeah, I mean, this game just feels like a, a push on both sides. You know, Ole Miss offense, they put up 71 points against Mercer, like you mentioned. But Tulane, you know, that Michael Pratt had an insane game against South Alabama. I think that, like you mentioned, Tulane's defense – the difference in that game was that Tulane was able to create the timely turnovers, uh, to, you know, to create some momentum and pull that away because that's a really good South Alabama team. And to beat them by 38 to 17, we're going to come back to that and look at, man, this Tulane team is, can really go far and be a New Year's Six Bowl game. But if they win this game, they're going to see more than New Year's Six. I'm not saying they're, this is going to be a college football playoff team, but definitely going to be a top 15 team uh, by next week's poll. Uh, so, I did one side of me wants to go with Tulane. I go with the upset, uh, but I'm going to go with Ole Miss. I'm just going to go go with the generic pick here. I just trust Ole Miss's offense and Jackson Dart against Tulane. Now I think that this is going to be a high scoring shootout. I'm I'm, I'm looking at the over now. It's like 65, 66. I don't know if it's going to get to that. We'll see. Uh, but I think that this is going to be an insane game. I think that Ole Miss wins, but Tulane covers. I think that especially at home. In New Orleans, as a sold out crowd, Willie Fritz just keeps telling everybody, I don't have any more tickets. It's sold out. It's been sold out for weeks. Stop asking me. So I think that Tulane, we're going to find out that they're for real, but I think that Ole Miss on the road gets the slight victory. Uh, so I think I'm going to go Ole Miss like 34 31. I think it's going to be like a fuel goal game. Tulane is not afraid of anybody. We saw last year against USC, against Kansas State. So I think that Ole Miss wins, but it's going to be by a thread. Yeah, it's going to be a close one. I'm ready for that one to be a great game uh, for a little SEC 
uh, team to come into New Orleans and try to hold their own against a tough opponent uh, that wins a lot of games at home. Uh, moving away from the Power Five, let's get into the fun stuff, the Group of Five Game of the Week. Of course, it includes a Sunbelt Fun Belt team in Texas State. Now, does Texas State hold a candlestick to the UTSA Roadrunners, who was on our Group of Five Games of the Week last week as well? Uh, they come in as the 14-point favorite at home. Does UTSA win by 14 in the Alamo Dome? Absolutely. I think UTSA will win by 14 or more against Texas State. Texas State, I don't know. It, it's it's a team was week one a uh, kind of a friggin' crazy win. Yeah, do you go to Baylor and and come up with 42? That's kind of wild to me. Um, for Texas State, you know, or I'm sorry for for UTSA, you know, you lose week one at Houston, but you're a 14 point dog at home. Uh, you're a 14, you know, 14 point favorite at home. You have to cover the 14 in this one. UTSA is a different animal at home. I don't think Texas state is going to be able to win this game. Uh, Texas state. Oh man. It's so tough. You, you look at UTSA and say, they are going to win this by 14 plus based off of what you've seen them play in the Alamo Dome. Um, but God, it's so much. I, I don't know. Um, I guess I'll give Texas State Texas State to cover the 14. How about that? Um, UTSA wins by a touchdown in this game. Um, it's going to be a high-scoring shootout, I think. Both of these teams lack defense quite a bit. Um, I'll go 45-38. It's going to be a massive one, but I think UTSA wins. Points, points, and points uh, in this one. But, yeah, this was a tale of two uh, spectrums here in week number one, Texas State. Got the big win on the road in Waco against Baylor while UTSA's offense uh, just was not impressive in that loss against Houston in week number one. And like you mentioned, I, I saw that 14 spread. I was like, uh, is this right? What is Vegas trying to tell us? I'm going to say right now, there's no way in heck that UTSA wins this one by 14. Just based on what I saw in week number one, you know, TJ Finley looked really good in that game against Baylor. UTSA's offense has to get it going if they want to keep up with Texas State because Texas State's offense was rolling against a Baylor defense. You know, Dave Veranda is one of the best defensive minds in all of college football, but it might be time for him to go the way that Baylor's been looking the past couple of games going dating back to last season. So I think that UTSA, I'm going to go with the Roadrunners at home. They, like, this team – Hardly ever loses in the Alamo Dome. I think that Frank Harris in this offense needs a bounce back. I think they get it here. But Texas State, we've already seen it. They are not afraid of anybody. I think that they're not going to be afraid of UT San Antonio. I do think that this is going to be more of an offense of game. I'll go like 31 to 28. I think that UTSA wins this one, but it's not going to be by 14. So I think that Texas State covers, but the Roadrunners get the job done at home. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm glad we're both going with the Roadrunners here. I, I just think it's a good bounce back game for them here and a good quality opponent in Texas State. So uh, we'll see the Roadrunners hopefully get back to one and one today and, and see and see what really happens uh, for them. On to our last segment um, is going to be our best bets for today's slate. Um, of course. We're going to include one from yesterday's slate uh, that was on our bet line, uh, of course. And, and that game was the Fighting Illini. They headed to Lawrence, Kansas. I, I just, that was a crazy game to me to think that Kansas wasn't going to blow them out. Uh, you know, it just was one of those where I was like, man, you know, the way Kansas football has looked as of late, you know, beginning of last season with them opening up on a win streak and going crazy. I just felt that it was a really good pick to take them at the three line. They were a three point favorite at home. I mean, a big win like that for them uh, is really big for us. Of course, moving into it. Um, I think that it's going to be really tough to, to, to be a, an Illinois team that's going to try to fight back uh, and, put something together i mean kansas wins 34 to 23 um and a good quality win for them you saw both quarterbacks 
for Kansas come on the field to, for the first play of the game. First play of the game. And uh, Mr. Bean comes out there with, with Jalen Daniels, and uh, they make it happen right off the bat. Running game was key in that one, so took them. That's the first lock-in for a bet. Tyler, what's your best bet for the day? You know, I always got to respect Mr. Bean and Kansas' offense. I've really been a fan of them. But I'm going to stay in Big 12 country. The Big 12 has definitely been treating us right uh, on the bet slip as of late. I'm going to go to the Oklahoma Sooners. They're facing off against SMU. This is a 5 o'clock game, uh, so get in your bets. Early on, this is a battle of uh, 1-0 and and 1-0 teams. If you saw Oklahoma's offense in week number one, you better watch it. Again, they put up 73 points. I know Arkansas State, they're not going to be one of the best teams uh, in the Sun Belt. Uh, you know, they even made Butch Jones uh, cry on the sideline of how badly that they were beating him. Uh, but, you know, SMU, they lost uh, their their quarterback and Mordecai in the offseason. He's now at uh, Wisconsin now, I believe, is now the Wisconsin's uh, starting quarterback. So they've lost some offensive production. Uh, SMU's defense, just I just don't think they're going to have an issue. You know, I just don't think that they're going to be able to stop Dylan Gabriel in this offense. I just feel like Oklahoma, this is just a team – that looks motivated. You know, they went six and six last year. They lost to Florida State uh, in the Cheez-It Bowl last year uh, to in the off the season. So I think that Brent Venable squad is just uh, a men on mission. And with Oklahoma getting the 15 and a half, I think that they cover that. It's just like SMU won't be able to keep up with Oklahoma. I think that Oklahoma's defense uh, really looked good against Arkansas State. I think they, they're going to be able to continue that momentum, especially with Brent Venables there. This, he's not going to let whatever happened uh, last year of them, their defense, completely falling apart. So I think that you hammer 15 and a half. I definitely feel confident. Uh, I think that the Sooners uh, win big uh, today at five. Yeah, in closing, folks, the last thing that you need to hammer is Colorado to cover the three-point spread against Nebraska at home. Uh, please hammer it because I don't think that Nebraska is going to be able to stop the offense of Colorado I fully think that they will take control of that one from the opening kickoff. Um, so take the Buffalo at the minus three, run with it, hammer it, take it to the bank. Run with um, Ralphie. Yeah, it's just one where get out of the way, though. Obviously, you don't get hit because you might not wake up. Um, but, yeah, I mean, take Colorado all day long. It is one of those that uh, you just don't even need to think about for more than a second. If you see Colorado there playing like that, take it, folks. Absolutely take it. Um, Tyler, I think it was a fantastic week one, week two today. Continuing on some amazing games that we will see today. Uh, of course, tonight's games are good as well. Uh, but really, there's any brand of football that you want to watch at college football. There is all types throughout the day from the 11 a.m. kickoffs all the way to tonight. I think that, folks, you have to get in and watch these teams early in the season, set the tone for college football uh, for the season and for the playoff and who will be there. We will be focused on it and ready for it. And, of course, we'll be ready to recap week two with you guys here next week and uh, really get into, you know, close to conference play. I'm counting down for the conference play. I'm ready for it. Tyler and uh is there anything else on your end that you want to inform the folks about that they need to go do uh or, or focus on this weekend no just uh just you know college football is definitely here and just on our side uh subscribe to our channel sports uh scrum podcast uh, the main show is live uh, on monday nights uh coast to coast is going to be live whenever you want to i'm if we Get a lot of engagement on the Saturday shows. So we'll definitely keep it there. And then SEC Talk uh, is rolling uh, throughout the week, uh, talking about all things uh, in the SEC. Uh, so we got things uh, rolling here on the Sports Scramble. Absolutely. So we're bringing it all at you. Chet's out there doing golf content for Sports for Sports Scramble. Uh, we're here bringing you guys college football as we always do. And we will see you guys again next week. We will recap week two and get on to week three in this fast-moving 12-week football season.